So I have a wonderful panelist, um, panel team members here who are going to be discussing uh, one of the biggest challenges, what is going to be the new role of youth. So since 2018, India's working age population has grown larger than the dependent population. Now, while many Asian economies have been able to gain from this demographic divide, we are, not, we are at a very strange time now. Uh, the pandemic has proved that it's going to be a major threat to the economy. <clears throat> So we're looking at an employment crisis, a stark digital divide is now visible, and many are wondering whether higher education is even a viable option anymore. So what does all of this mean for the youth? What's going to be their new role in times of coronavirus and after that? We have with us here Sumit Anand, founder and CEO of Krugs.com, Nikhil Chawla, founder and executive Business School, Guy and under Create Foundation. On that note, let's begin. Let all the panelists start speaking. The last few lines we couldn't hear, Advija, there was some problem with your audio. I think, um, you yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Sumit. Uh, I run a software as a service startup uh, called Crux. We primarily are targeting MSMEs. We help them go digital with their business. And besides that, I also do pro bono work in terms of I have my own NGO. I'm part of, but I also do a lot of work with rural youth. So some of my current projects are more about uh, working with rural youth, helping them pick up entrepreneurship, look at local opportunities and convert that into business. So the current challenges, I think what we saw recently was uh, typically in MSMEs in India and their whole idea of going digital was the big divide between do it yourself and do it for me. So. If you typically look at it, most of the SaaS tools are used by more tech savvy companies. Uh, but for people who are not that tech savvy, it becomes quite a difficult uh, challenge in terms of the learning curves are very long for them. And that's what we try to address. We work with some of the government bodies to reach out to the various MSMEs and uh, try to help them go digital. And we saw a big thrust post COVID in the interest that people had to conduct their businesses in a digital way. Likewise, I was while during the lockdown, I was also working with certain rural youth to see how they can grab these opportunities or look at developing certain grassroots level businesses to address uh, their local issues. So looking at the local economies and creating new business opportunities out of that. So that has been uh, my body of work that I'm involved with. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, OK. okay. So first yeah, of all, thank you. So much. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, great opportunity to uh, uh, to join a great panel, which I think, in fact, is one of the most important topics that uh, uh, we need to address. It's about the the role of youth in uh, yeah in develop in in the in the new reality, and uh, I'm uh, here as a representative of one of the top uh, um, business educational uh, institutions, uh, which is located in Spain. However, which truly has the global spirit because uh, having uh, people on campus, we have almost 160 nationalities and 95% of students in a single classroom comes uh, you know from uh, uh, rarely would come from the same uh, from the same country um, 
before what we have seen is that um, education has been mainly focused on the on the big corporations however uh, ie was one of those institutions which was challenging the boundaries and bringing the importance of uh, entrepreneurial thinking not necessarily for starting your own business however also for reinventing the uh, reinventing the big corporations and he has been one of the first educational institutions to start offering education online and uh, when uh, we were thinking in 90s you know it was something alternative and nice to have it suddenly became with COVID as uh, something that is must to have and um, this is this type of kind of challenger uh, mindset we're instilling with all our students and uh, I'm happy to uh, to develop more on this uh, throughout the uh, throughout the, today's conversation bring a little bit more inspiration and trust in terms of uh, the timing that uh, this moment of change is actually the best timing to invest into your own self. Thank you. Um, Nikhil, do you want to go next? You need to unmute Hi. yourself. Yep. Hi guys, I'm Nikhil Chavla, founder of the Unbiased blog. Now I set up this platform 10 years ago and the whole idea was to provide unbiased information views and reviews to everybody for anything and everything. But later on, it became a technology platform where we cover primarily like consumer tech, and then we cover big data, enterprise data, everything under the sun that comes to technology. But before I start today's conversation, I would like to stress on the fact that with every crisis comes deep challenges and opportunities for transformation. That said, what are we doing on this panel today? I, I think we were supposed to be in Vietnam doing this Horaces India meeting, but that all changed thanks to the pandemic. And, you know, uh, this kind of a challenge made Horasis do its first online global meeting. And here we are sitting, talking to you guys, coming across online. And this is what I believe, like, when it comes to a strong, when it comes to a crisis, we have to be strong. We have to come together as a collaborating team and work together. Now, I'm a firm believer that heavily burdened youth is already, you know, uh, converged with a lot of problems and things that, so we need to reinvent the wheel ourselves. We don't have to burden the youth for that. So instead, work at the work together as a team, you know, firm communities online, share the burden and make things a bit easier for everybody. Now, as a content creator and someone who understands technology, I'm working on new platforms, videos and podcasts that will help the youth and everybody else, you know, cope up with the new normal. I think it's an opportunity for everyone to, you know, unite, forge connections across countries and continents and truly share work with the global audience. I don't think so prior to this crisis, we were able to do that or, you know, made full use of this opportunity. Now it's the time to, you know, come forward, work together as a team globally and, you know, uh, challenge this, what we are facing right now. Thank you, Nikhil. Rajat? Uh, yes, Katya. Um, so, hi, myself, Rajat, and I'm the uh, founder and current CEO of GlobalOps. So GlobalOps is a platform where we connect uh, international audience to come together on one platform and get exposed to the ideas and to the uh, be a part of prestigious global events and conferences and these things. So uh, we recently worked with Telangana government for the India Joy, like India's largest uh, gaming multimedia animation festival. We brought uh, from across, uh, 50, across 50 countries. And other than that, I'm also running the platform called For You Work, where uh, we are specialized in uh, bridging the gap between opportunities and youth. So we partner with uh, different universities, governments, other organizations, and ensure that these opportunities would be uh, reaching to all the youth uh, and So pretty much democratizing the opportunities, uh, democratizing the opportunities, and especially access to them. And uh, so regarding uh, this panel and specifically the uh, new role of you, I mean, this is kind of major crisis and opportunity to India because the majority of the uh, population over here is youth and regarding the demographic community and we could be having a advanced language. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, quickly a little bit about me. Um, I work as an associate director at one of India's largest real estate companies, which, which is also my family business. We focus, we focus on project planning, project management, and marketing. Our current portfolio houses companies like Accenture, HP, Uber, Intuit, etc. Um, in the past year, I have also founded a social enterprise called Create Foundation. Create focuses on better urban planning and development. We do work both on policy level and on ground awareness initiatives. 
Um, additionally, I sit on the board of an NGO called Niswartha Foundation. Um, Niswartha is an NGO that um, works on providing access to higher education for underprivileged children. Um, my work is diverse and it enables me to um, play the role of a leader, entrepreneur, employee, investor, and a conscious citizen. From this, I can confidently tell you that um, change is the only constant. And uh, we are all in an unprecedented and unfamiliar um, space, uh, both professionally and for some of us also personally. Um, when it comes to youth specifically in a country um, whose average age is 24 year plus, then we need to think at addressing our issues holistically and practically. We need to rethink our education system. Um, we need to th rethink the future of work. We need to work on our knowledge, skills, and abilities and connect to both of them um, to the, not only the economy, but as well as our personal goals and well-being. Um, we need um, to groom leadership. We need to encourage intergenerational representation while addressing the elephant in the room, which is climate change. So I'm excited to be on this panel discussing possible solutions and um, possible solutions with this multiple expertise. Um, just checking if Adija's back. Okay. Um, for um, just quickly for all those who are just joining in, I'll just tell you what we're discussing. We're, we're discussing the new rule, new role of youth. Um, the COVID pandemic struck less at the youth than the elderly. This suggests that India's future economic surgency may be assured by its demographic dividend. Um, and we're discussing the new factors that that must be raised to assure the best use of youth and what reforms might the government and what we consider to benefit young workers. Um, yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> that was helpful. Um, so uh, now that we've got a quick introduction of what you do and what your work revolves around, I had certain specific questions that I wanted to understand um, on this. Uh, so I'll start one by one. Um, I'll start with Sumit. Uh, Sumit Anand, who is the founder and CEO of Krugs.com. Um, so with what I wanted to understand was that, you know, we've already we've been facing an employment crisis uh, before the pandemic as well. Uh, now, the move to the digital space and with no little concept of office space, uh, coupled with the increasing thrust on automation, have also rendered many people unemployable. Uh, do you think jobs will be the biggest challenge for the youth? And how do you think we can overcome the challenge of rising unemployment? Yeah, certainly, I think that's the one of the biggest challenges and it has now kind of got multiplied uh, post-COVID. Uh, but I also see a big opportunity in front of us uh, due to this, uh, you know, diversify from China kind of sentiment, which we see globally. Now, uh, there is no overnight solution to this. We need to look at uh, measures which, are, which can be taken immediately, maybe the next six months, one year, two year kind of planning uh, needs to go from the government side and a lot of other uh, bodies which are relevant. But the biggest challenge is to revive the global demand. So you can look at jobs, but right now what is under biggest pressure is demand. So if there is no demand, what will businesses do? Where will they get the money to pay the employees? And if people don't have disposable income, where will the demand come from? So it's like that sort of a cycle and a quite a chicken and egg kind of a problem right now at our hands. So no only possibility in near term that I see is to take a higher share of the reduced global pie. So there is a certain demand globally. Everyone is fighting for it. We need to try and get a higher share of that. And that's how uh, we will be able to retain our existing businesses in whatever growth curve they are in while we create new businesses to take a lot of uh, move away from China kind of sentiment and get those businesses here and create more jobs. So the thrust is going to be more on how can we be more competitive. So even if government like, let's say tomorrow, offers you jobs and income on a platter, it's not going to help. Because the, the next big problem that we face is employability of our youth. So how do we almost more than 50 percent of the workers will be requiring reskilling or upselling by 2022? Almost 100 days of learning is what is expected. They need to go through in order to upskill themselves or reskill themselves. So I think there is, is a responsibility, not just with the government, but the new youth also needs to take charge of their destinies. So, you know, when you say real patriotism, it's being of use to your country. Maybe this is the right opportunity 
the need to come forward, take charge, ensure that India makes most out of this opportunity and adversity kind of situation that we have. Having said that, let's look at some of the things which I think government needs to do is obviously cleanse the system so that schemes and benefits reach the needy. Uh, focus on policy, enforcement of the policy. Look at work culture based on value systems and ethics and create right mix of skills. And this is what will make India as a more or a favorite destination for the businesses to come. And that will help us attract more businesses and thus create more jobs. On the other hand, I think the whole world is also rethinking on the business model. So we need to create new business models, which are more driven by sustainable living, climate change. It's like enabling circular economy supply chains rather than the linear ones. Uh, another big aspect is going to be that the gig economy is going to grow. It's already growing and it's going to grow even further. So people who are outplaced, they need to find gig economy jobs and keep themselves occupied, get some earning from that. And we need to prepare our youth for the same. So there, on the other hand, if you look at uh, youth, what they can do, I think developing better work values and ethics is very important. So a Chinese works 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. for six days a week. And that culture helps them do whatever they are today. They need to be more employable. They need to invest more time in sharpening their skills to be more contemporary. So kind of be more aware as well as upskill themselves. And the biggest route is going to be take the entrepreneurial route. Because it's not that overnight all the jobs will get revived or created. So find opportunities in your small city, in your village, build upon that, help grow rural economies. And look at solving India specific problems rather than a me to copy paste models. Think ahead, think different. So I think that's where most of the solution lies. Thank you so much. Um, that was very interesting. Um, although I, you said something about how we can also not use ban China products and not use them, and uh, I, w I would, I am sure there will be some question on that. And I hope, like you know, we get time to come back to that later. Uh, Nikhil, um, the founder and executive director of the Unbiased Blog. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about was, you know, you said. Um, you know, we had this conversation about uh, access to technology, right? And recently there was a news of in Kerala, a Dalit girl who killed herself because the family didn't have a phone and the television wasn't working. So she couldn't attend online classes. And then last month we've witnessed this huge digital divide, the rural urban divide, the gender divide. Uh, and we are clearly not digital India yet. Uh, so how do you see that changing? Do you see this uh, this pandemic as changing that as an opportunity or uh, how do we ensure that digital gap is reduced? To be honest, this news stuck me hard. You know, it is not one of those cases that happened and it, you know, you'll be forgetting I'm about mute. it. I'm, I'm on, I'm not on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Okay. So I was saying that, you know, to be honest, this news stuck me hard. It is not just one of those cases that somebody committed suicide because they didn't have access to a smartphone or data connectivity. You know, many such cases are coming up in the country and I really felt helpless. I really wanted to do something. So what I did is called up my fellow tech journalists, content creators and smartphone makers. And, you know, I wanted to discuss with them the solution to this problem. My plan is to build a system where we can, you know, ascertain who is in dire need of these devices and really facilitate for them, not just, you know, make a list of people who require it, but also somehow arrange it for them and make it a possibility for them to gather more knowledge and learn through online, the new way of learning. So, you know, really, we really can't let somebody take his or her life just because they didn't have access to a smartphone or a data connection. That's really sad on our part as a society. So what I think that, you know, uh, to begin with, the COVID-19 pandemic has already caused more than, I think, 1.6 billion children out of school because, you know, every school in one around, around 160 plus countries have been shut down. So 80 percent of the world's students are sitting at home and they are trying to gather new way of learning. And it's not just students, it's parents, it's teacher, everybody is involved. And it's a new, new uh, normal for them also, because for teacher, it's not easy to teach them with. 60 people in the class and, uh, you know, online is a new way for them also. For parents, it's a tough situation because they have to be with their children. Similarly for students, you know, those who are brilliant, it's a different thing because they can, you know, obviously access resources and all that stuff. But people who are really not intrigued to learn or, you know, wanting to learn, 
even in classes people are trying to ignore the teacher so imagine what is the scenario when you're doing that in online education so that is really concerning but what we should be really worried about is the loss in learning i think increased dropout rates because people are really not able to learn the, the way they want to and also children also missing their most important meal of the day because most of these children are poor and their source of meal was what was they what they were given in schools now they are missing out on that also so moreover uh, most countries have very une- uh, unequal education system that negatively impacts you know the growth of the children and uh, when it rains it really rains opposed for the poor people, poor children and uh, well the richer countries are definitely could better with the, the new way of learning the education online strategies and everything but the middle aged and poor countries uh, middle income and poor countries have really really situation tough situation so many children do have you know access to desks books internet connectivity but most of them are still missing on that so my idea is to work on a scenario where we can somehow as a society uh, you know fill that gap or you know at least try to smaller the, the gap you know uh, countries have shifted to different approaches using technology to teach children or distributing physical packets of books to of children so that they can continue education but again it's a very solitary way of education because you're sitting alone listening to a video or you know reading some online material which is not really for everybody because you know i'll be very d- distracted myself to be honest if i'm sitting in a class and i have to listen to some lecture for an hour i might be distracted and it's not for everybody it's not everybody's cup of tea and that's really concerning so we might have to think of an hybrid situation where we can have online classes also and also you know a one to one kind of a class for students but that's something that we have to see over time because over the last uh, few decades we've seen the progress that uh, students have really got access to devices and connectivity but again as i mentioned it's not for everybody and the whole plan is to provide it to everybody the learning resources and how to bring them better education and also the mental health cost of this crisis will come out in coming months we can't really ascertain it right now because you know it just started the pandemic is like for a few months only now the actual crisis on the mental health and when we see the uh, grades degrading and also you know mental health disorders substance abuse child maltreatment and lot of things are on increase we are seeing that you know uh, children being abused because they're at home with their parents and their families and it's a really concerning situation because when they are at uh, at this time when they were used to be at school and parents were at work there was some distance between them also now they're all together so the poor children are really facing those issues and we've seen such cases of substance abuse and a lot of other things but i strongly believe that you know these children the youth must quickly align themselves to the new normal and we as a society should be really helping them you know there will be a fear of job loss school closures and you know isolation and everything but we have to overcome this together as a team and everybody not just Uh, one country it has to be the whole continent across the continents across the countries and lastly i would like to say that when you go through a big crisis like this we really have to come stronger as a country as a planet and fight together and work together that's all from my end Adjuja, we can't hear you. can't hear you and just try putting your question in the chat so that we can continue
Gayatri, please take over. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tatiana, do you want to, from your perspective, um, tell us um, the new role of youth and how the government should complement it? Um, uh, sure. Uh, well, I probably cannot speak on behalf of the government. Uh, I can uh, say from the perspective of uh, the leading educational institution what we would like to see and where we think the solution uh, might be. Um, so just, uh, you know, continuing on what has been uh, already shared um, on the importance on the, on the role of the job market uh, and uh, on the role of, uh, of education and what comes first and what comes, uh, what comes next. Um, obviously, education plays an important role in terms of securing the job. However, education also has to uh, correspond to the market needs. Quite often, when we speak about the demand, uh, we tend to, you know, we, we tend to focus on the situation, uh, on the current situation, situation now. And that's why, uh, that's why quite often uh, the kids uh, start uh, taking courses or taking uh, learning and studying the degree which their parents think is the best one. However, if we would look into the statistics of um, or the results of the survey done by the World Economic Forum, then the skills that, uh, you know, that have been uh, there in play in 2016 are a completely different set of skills that is required of us now and which is foreseen to be demanded uh, in the future. And um, hence, this is something very, very important for us to keep in mind because um, one, uh, one of the important things is the mindset and, um, you know, and being sensitive uh, uh, towards uh, the world around us and trying to be a little bit uh, um, forward looking, right? And trying to interpret uh, uh, the environment that we see ourselves and trying to forecast where it might take us. Unfortunately, people are naturally very bad at predicting the future because if you would be looking into the Matrix movies, then already today, Madrid, where our campus is based, you know, we would imagine it with, I don't know, flying cars and etc. However, here we are and the world in reality haven't advanced in the last 20 years that much as we were uh, predicting. Why does that happen? I mean, there are a number of factors which are impacting that. On one hand side, when we're forecasting how the future will look like, we'll look into the past, right? However, there are a number of things which we call the uh, black swan. This, uh, you know, this unprecedented events which we cannot foresee. And actually COVID is one of those things which came to us like a black swan. And uh, it really digitalized and digitized uh, the companies because uh, right now, you know, there is even this joke of um, who is driving the digital transformation in your company, CEO, CEO, CFO, CMO, or whatever are the three letters. And the reality is that it's no longer, you know, uh, a choice. Um, so one of those things that we have to be uh, mindful of is how do we raise this a mind, uh, mindset in terms of uh, being always looking forward and not being captured in the moment of, uh, of today and now. And then... Um, when we, when I hear, you know, about, of course, like there is a difference between different countries and of course the living standard is different uh, all over the world and uh, we have to be mindful of that. However, I think the, um, there are a couple of things that we need to address before we even get uh, to the government. And this uh, something comes, uh, you know, from this NGO and uh, content creation, which actually will speak up uh, to the parents themselves. Which would uh, which would be making the right choices, you know, for their kids. In any case, I think today the educational market offers a number of different options to learn. And uh, if in the past you had to pay, uh, you know, you have to pay maybe a lot of money to get access, today there are a number of few tools which you are able to use. So it's all a matter of creating space and time for for taking this knowledge. Um, Speaking a little bit about, uh, you know, the current uh, reality and, uh, for example, what IE is doing from, from its side, uh, we've been the pioneer in terms of uh, online education. We were the first education institution offering online education. If you look into India, for example, then the biggest change has actually to come from employers because with uh, the degrees which exist online, you have to be very careful, I mean, what you study online. But uh, with degrees which come online, and in our case, our global MBA is ranked number uh, one uh, globally by financial time. Times, it's totally different than taking a course from one of the MOOCs, you know, and the online platforms. However, Indian companies are not ready to embrace and to recognize the online education as being at the par of the formal face-to-face -face education that we would uh, we would envision. 
So I think, uh, you know, the COVID actually brought a very good moment of time for when we don't have a, another option as continue online. Also for the whole market to rethink, what actually are we looking for? Are we looking for the students to have an experience or are we looking for them to get the right skills at the right time? And if I have to choose, then would I wait and delay my future for a year, you know, not knowing what is going to happen? Because as we said, I mean, we're very bad at forecasting the future. And should I rather, you know, take advantage of this current situation, which is a pure VUCA environment when it's uncertain, it's volatile, it's ambiguous, and uh, really prepare myself to take advantage of when the market will be picking up. I, I'm a strong believer, you know, that uh, it's uh, it's the, the great time to reinvent yourself. Actually, when I went to do the executive MBA with uh, IE, it was the time when Ukraine, and it's my home country, entered into war with Russia, and uh, the whole world collapsed. And every other weekend when I had to fly to IE to study and sit in classes, I was not sure if I'm going to be able to fly out or to fly back to see my daughter, who was at that time three years old. However, for me personally, it paid off. And I think, you know, uh, this is something that we have to be mindful of. More and more companies are looking and becoming also more open towards uh, the hybrid uh, uh, um, workspaces. And we've been doing one of the polls and we see that actually the majority of us, we don't want to go back to the office. We either want to continue working out of home or we want to have some kind of a flexible uh, flexible environment and I think this is something very important to, to consider and I think this would be reshaping the way we see things um, and actually the online education everything it also prepares us for this uh, for these chances there is a very great book uh, called Globotics which is discussing two big trends which are happening at the labor market one of it is how does the robotics and the whole RPA is impacting our jobs because now we have chatbots which are able to replace a number of uh, functions, being our assistants, being our bookers. However, there is another big trend when actually uh, Facebook and other big companies are now saying, fine, I mean, I'm fine not to have all the people based out of Silicon Valley. I'm happy to hire them in their own country and I will pay them based on the level of the salaries which exist there. So there is certain win-win. And I mean, in this book, what is discussed that actually we will see more of that. When even for the high, kind of we used to call them white collar works, the people will be able to work from a different market. So I think for all of us, it's a great opportunity and for Indian youth and uh, young professionals as well to be uh, able to. Sense that the labor market globally is also reshaping, and uh, there will be without even moving out of your country, you can work for Facebook and LinkedIn in Dublin or in Silicon Valley. Uh, my kind of general comment would be uh, an encouragement, uh, and to uh, Indian youth in particular, is to be a little bit more daring in the way you see education. We tend to think that. Um, a general management degree is the best solution because it's generic. However, it's actually a trap. Uh, the best way to get a job on the market is to go after the job uh, focused degrees. For example, big data, cybersecurity, uh, legal tech. So looking for those uh, opportunities of learning what can get you to the market as soon as possible. And then once you gain and you enter the market and you build yourself as a niche professional, you can always go for the general management courses. So if I would be uh, summarizing, while well, I believe that uh, labor market and market in general is going through a big reshape, it also offers for thinking people uh, a great opportunity to take this time to reskill themselves. And we have to be very mindful in terms of what we learn and being very clear for what we learn it. Thank you. Thank you. Gayatri, I'll just like quickly go to you. Um, same thing, like if you can speak a little on education and, you know, and what, what are the changes we are expecting. And also what I wanted to understand from you about skill development. So if you can a little expand on that, was it, is it a good time for that? Yes, great. Um, so I, um, following up um, and grounding my answer in, to more India perspective, I think... Um, in, in our country here, right, 70 million people are projected to enter the world uh, workforce by 2023 and 59 million of them are going to be aged between 15 and 30. Um, uh, so that's a large chunk of population that is um, 15 years to 30 years. So that's still there are so many people still uh, who are students who will probably be entering the workforce uh, workforce in the next two or three years. So I think I want to address this from a 
two part perspective one is um again um following up with that you know on the online education bit um online education in india even pre pandemic was in a very introductory stage where we were still um we were still learning how to make it accessible we were still learning how to recognize our target audience we were still um we were trying to curate content and we were trying to find vernacular um uh, find people to translate it into vernacular languages for ease of access of it in our country so um i just want to give you a quick example on how we can address it um one of in uh, one of uh, indian forests biggest success story has been the project tiger so um, tiger being one of those this uh, one of those um, animals that was going to go extinct then um the government of india came together and said hey let's start this project tiger where we try to save and um make sure that this species does not go extinct so then when they started this um project they realized that tiger being um being on top of the food chain right um, once they started working on saving it they were able to save the rest of the ecosystem so similarly while we are addressing the problem of education and online education we need to work on it in a very holistic manner where we work on three major um three major uh, problem areas from my perspective one is uh, we need to also for while we are curating content while we are making our content vernacular uh, we need to also not forget um to train teachers and um we we need to include them in the overall um uh, overall accessibility of education um so the other other large bit that we are addressing and debating over the past few weeks um every TV, most tv channels are talking about how we um how can we make education more accessible there's a lot of online blogs discussing it i think from my perspective um in india we don't not many people not many people can afford laptops and and technology but but what we already have in abundance and is television radio and smartphones so if we can come up with solutions to include these and then and then address the problem i think that's one way to address it and from a skill development perspective again i think again going back to another example um so if if somebody wants to when somebody joins a skill development course um um if they go into for example a garment garment uh, uh, garment focused skill development they will probably start with a basic salary of 12 to 14000 which i'm not sure what the minimum wage for that is um and then over a period of 3 4 or 5 years um they will probably reach 17000 rupees per month but then if they go into beautician training or if they go into um say uh, data entry they will probably start at a 15000 but within the next year they will their salary will sort of increase faster than if they were in the garment industry right so i feel like that shift um we need to recognize skilling from that perspective on how do we add a uh, better knowledge skills and ability and we need to learn to address the problem from how do we create certifiable skill development um uniformly certifiable skill development um courses for example if i graduated from a cbse or a icse or a ib um then when i go apply for my undergraduate or masters people recognize what or people have a assumption of what i have learned similarly for the skills we need to standardize the process of what are we addressing and make sure that the employer is aware, uh, is aware of what what the skill means or what the certificate means um from a very women perspective i feel like um there are we need to address women participation in the workforce because um from what from world economic forums assessment about uh, in india we currently have 324 million people in the workforce and then only 91 million of them are women and so how do we address this problem from again from a women perspective is we need to comp- the system needs to complement um their efforts with the issue and solve the issues that the women are facing because women generally go to work 
and then they go then they go back home and work again so any human will burn out with, with this um continuous if they continuously do this so they need to address it and see how do we include the concept of the gig economy or passion economy and include flexible work hours include um and then focus on regular upskilling and reskilling um so i i hope that sort of answers your question ajaja yes yes thank you so much gayatri rajat uh, i wanted to understand about entrepreneurs and will it be a difficult time and how do you think entrepreneurship can be promoted rajat unmute yourself Uh, am i audible now yes yeah so as usually like startups have less success rate like more than 90% of the startups mm-hmm. fail and due to the covid crisis where the cash flows has been stopped and many other issues uh, there has been no doubt that most of the startups has been failed and lot of heat we are getting and especially in industry specific like the startups in travel hospitality and this thing they took the maximum heat and uh, also comparison other industries or the sectors like online education or digital tech and it uh, they got a huge boost and so in this uh, especially pandemic thing i think uh, covid acted more as a catalyst whereas it uh, accelerated the pace of digital education or uh, uh, work from home i mean remote working and this kind of trends and especially in these times we have more need of uh, entrepreneurship and people going to be self employed and these things so one thing that we need to work upon or the governments need to stretch or even as a society is like we need to encourage uh, the risk taking behavior because uh, especially in a country like india where we are more conservative and not i mean failure is not okay here i mean the fail, uh, failure should be made it as normal or it's not as a big deal only then we have a cultural shift where entrepreneurship should uh, can be encouraged and the other thing is there are many other government schemes and as we are a young country and there are many skilled uh, there is lot of skilled workforce too i mean even the nsdc and the other agencies are working upon this specific thing so there is no much uh, lack for this thing but the only thing that uh, i mean we need uh, to address is like the risk taking area and the making sure uh, the government schemes and the other policies are accessible to the majority of the people Okay, so we can uh, open it to questions. We have a quick minute left. Uh, there's already one question. Can you all see the question on your screen? Yeah, I think we can. Okay. Any any other questions? Like, please feel free to send quickly so that we can quickly answer this. I Or if anyone we... wants to add anything else, like, please go ahead. I think we have a question from Avinash. uh which is talking about during this pandemic situation youth all over india has helped migrant workers to get food water medicine and transport uh what will be the role of youth post covid i think uh, it has been um, recently uh, the prime minister announced a scheme for rural development so that's where most of the migrant workers are back uh, a lot of youth is there which is available as a manpower or our workforce uh, in the rural economies so rather than uh, we were earlier looking at the indian city is almost 40% will be there uh, by 2030 for most of our population but now i think we have to look at a different model where we need to look at rural development we need to utilize this youth where they are and uh, develop our rural areas or typically more suburbs so not right in the center of the city but villages and suburban areas which are around the city maybe 100 km sort of a radius uh, is what we can look at Okay so I think anyway the time is over now Okay thank you so much everyone I know it was really quick and short <laughs> but thank you Thank you thanks everyone thank you so much thank you thank you everybody Do not forget to take your group B